All right, good afternoon, and welcome to the CARE360 sponsored webinar, Inside Macro, MIPS Track Explained. My name is Colby Dix, and I will serve as your moderator and host for today. Our agenda today is fairly simple. We'll dive right into Kelly's presentation shortly, and there will be a Q&A session directly following. Please also stay with us for a brief overview of CARE360's complete suite of healthcare IT solutions. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our presenter today, Kelly Whittle. Kelly's bio is up on the screen now, and you can see that we're very lucky to have someone with such experience available to us. Her 20 plus years of dedication to healthcare IT and consulting has earned her great renown in our industry and is a valued consultant and mentor. And we welcome you, Kelly Whittle. Good afternoon, everyone. I am thrilled to be here for today's topic. For those that are new to my introduction, I'll just give you the 90-second Kelly Whittle to orient you to my voice and my pacing. I am passionate about changing complicated things into simple concepts so that my clients and my peers can be successful in transition. I've worked 20 years, as Colby said, in helping to stabilize chaos through strong data-driven plans and strategies. I'm happy to join you today to talk about MIPS. Today's webinar is going to follow a, a fairly simple question and answer format of sorts in which I'll be asking a few high-level questions of Kelly, and she'll provide the answers and the insight that we hope will provide quite useful. In our industry, change does occur regularly, and it's hard not to feel some uncertainty when we're awash with these endless acronyms describing nothing short of a labyrinthine process surrounding reimbursement. In today's session, part two of our series with Kelly, we're going to be taking a deeper dive into the MIPS reimbursement track, which a majority of practices will be utilizing in the near future. Before we get into the intricacies of MIPS, Kelly, do you mind giving us a primer on the differences between MIPS and APMs so that we might understand why the MIPS track is indeed so prevalent? Absolutely. That's a great place to start. For those of you that are brand new to the MACRA regulation, MACRA stands for the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act. It is the regulation that is referred to when we think about MACRA. MACRA divides into two tracks, if you will. Track one is referred to as MIT, which stands for Merit-Based Incentive Program. And we'll talk about the purpose of MIPS in a moment. The second track under MACRA is referred to as APM, or Alternative Payment Models. Now, under APMs, there are actually two divisions. The first is the advanced alternative payment models, and the second is referred to as MIPS APM. We'll talk about each of these at a high level by the end of our time today. Let's take a look at MIPS in a little more detail. MIPS is designed for providers or clinicians that care for their patients using the traditional Medicare beneficiaries that are billing under fee-for-service to make the transition to value-based healthcare. It offers an opportunity to earn a bonus and avoid and or a penalty in the first year. And in the first year, I'm referring to 2017. If you're brand new to this macro regulation, you might not be aware that the penalty and bonus opportunity this year is actually worth 4% of your Medicare Part B payments. So MIPS is designed for those that are just getting their feet wet in value-based care and programs. It allows them to report as individuals or as groups and gives them maximum flexibility to pick their pace. Now let's contrast that with APMs, alternative payment models. Alternative payment models provides a framework for a group of providers to take advantage of a 5% Medicare incentive payment. And that is 5% per beneficiary per month. So this is a, a pretty large incentive payment for participating in an APM. It also allows providers or clinicians to avoid having to do the work associated with MIPS. Now these innovative payment models do carry a risk. There's an opportunity to earn a bonus and also an 
opportunity to have to cover the excess expenses associated with care. So there's an upside and a downside risk, plus that 5% incentive payment for those participating in an APM. Excellent. And with so many providers uh, sort of defaulting into the MIPS track, certainly at the beginning of, uh, of this retooling, um, let's move forward then and examine MIPS in more detail. There's four categories that comprise the merit-based incentive program and in turn, the provider score as well. Kelly, do you mind explaining the four categories for us? Absolutely. These four categories, as Colby mentioned, are associated with MIPS. APM is a different framework, so we're going to focus on MIPS here first. What we have in 2017 is a composite score that will be built out of these four performance categories. The first and most heavily weighted category is the quality metrics category. In 2017, in general, a provider or clinician will have 60% of their composite score weighted based on their quality outcomes. Now, there are currently over 270 quality measures available to be chosen. Providers that are reporting for the full year must pick at least six quality measures to report on. One must be a an outcome-based measure or a high-priority measure, which tells us that not all measures are created equal when it comes to the weight and the scoring. So it's important to take a look strategically at which of those quality measures a provider might choose to report that on. As we move to the second category, it is the cost category or the resource utilization category. In 2017, this category is actually not weighted. CMS will take a benchmark level of score for each of our providers. They'll pull that data from claims. There's not much a provider can do to influence cost in 2017, but be aware, starting in 2018, that cost category then becomes weighted. So not, not much to think about in 17. As we move to improvement activities, we see that improvement activities will compose 18% of the composite score for 2017. This is actually an attestation and is designed to make operational improvements for the clinical practice. Clinicians must choose four out of more than 90 activities, and those activities are actually broken out into nine buckets or nine categories of improvement type activities interesting to take a look at those activities and identify if two, three, or four are actually something that you're already doing in your practice. Remember, again, that's an attestation. The last category is advancing care information. This is the category that most closely aligns with what we call meaningful use. It is 25% of the 2017 score. It's designed to increase patient engagement and exchange of information across electronic medical records, or you might refer to them as electronic health records. There are two measure sets that fall under the advancing care information, and those measure sets are aligned with your EHR certification. So you'll want to make sure you get the right set of measures, either 2014 certification or 2015 certification. Now, once you have the individual categories mapped out for a strategy, you'll want to think about how that composite score will be built. And I think we're going to cover that in a subsequent question. I'm sure we will. Now that we have a definition of these terms, it is time to dive in. Uh, this next bit does get a little more tricky to navigate because, as Kelly mentioned, there's quite a few variables to consider uh, within each category, really, and how these payment adjustments are determined. Uh, so moving to question three, how then will MIPS be used to determine payment adjustments? Yeah, this is where the uh, scoring gets exciting, if you will. It's the a mathematical portion that takes you most closely to the opportunity to earn a bonus, which is always my favorite topic in this industry. It's how do you make sure you're getting paid for the care that's being provided? So let's take a look at quality. As I mentioned, for the average eligible clinician under MIPS, 60% of that score 
will be uh, of the composite score will be weighted to quality. Under the quality category, you will earn your baseline of points, and then there's an opportunity to earn bonus points as well. Those two, your points earned and any bonus points are then divided by the maximum number of points that are eligible based on your provider type. I want to pause there and say that if you are a hospital-based MIPS eligible clinician, 60% of your weighted score actually will increase to 85%. The reason is that as a hospital-based clinician, you do not have control of the technology that's deployed within the hospital, or you typically do not. So CMS is allowing the advancing care information, which is 25% of the score, to be shifted under quality for those hospital-based providers. So your score would be weighted then to 85% um, associated with quality. Let's take a look at cost. Now, it's 0% in 2017 of that total weight. But when it is scored starting in 2018 and weighted, CMS will be taking a look at 10 episodes of care. Each episode will be worth 10 points. It will then be divided by the number of your score measures. And this is where it gets a little bit complicated, but specialty-based uh, diagnosis codes and procedures will be identified for episodes of care. So for example, if you're a, a radiologist, uh, you, you might have only one or two episodes of care or types of care that will factor into your cost, while um, internal medicine or primary care docs will have a, a broader range of episodes of care that they can be scored against. There's a maximum number uh, of points under cost. It's 100 points maximum. Once you identify the, the number of measures that you'll be scored on, 10 points per episode of care, you'll produce a maximum score for cost, which then gets factored in to your composite score. Let's take a look at our improvement activity. We know that in 2017, it's 15% of our total composite score is the weight. We'll determine a total number of points scored and again, this is an attestation, so there's plenty of opportunity to earn full points here. You'll then uh, divide your numerator and your denominator with a maximum of 40 points and multiply that by 100 to produce out your percentage. Advancing care information, this is the, the piece that's closest to meaningful use or is the version of meaningful use under MACRA. It's 25% of your score. It's a baseline list of measures that you must meet, and then there is two opportunities to increase your score. One is referred to as a performance um, piece of the score as well as a bonus opportunity. So two different categories to earn bonus points. Each of these four categories, three in 2017, four moving forward, then get factored into your overall composite score. Let's continue our discussion of how the MIPS scores will determine our payments. When we think about MIPS, we know that the program is designed as a net neutral budget impact for CMS, meaning that as the program gets rolling, the penalties will be used to pay out the bonuses. In the very first year here in 2017, CMS has set aside a pool of money to help cover the bonuses. It's $500 million pool to um, pay out in bonus money. Let's take a look at the scoring level. Now, as we get started, we don't have any historical data to determine what the threshold or the break-even score will look like. So CMS has set that to be three points. Three points out of 100, remember your, your composite score is a maximum of 100 points. So by earning three points, you will avoid a penalty in 2017. I encourage everyone on the call today to take action to avoid a penalty in 2017. It is likely to be the lowest bar 
from a, a score perspective in avoiding that penalty right here at the beginning of this transition year. CMS has built in a lot of flexibility to help those providers that want to participate to be successful in avoiding that penalty this year. So zero up to less than three points, you're looking at an automatic negative payment adjustment of 4%. If you hit three points and higher, you avoid that penalty and you're likely to have a neutral payment adjustment, so no impact in 2019. Now, if you earn four points all the way up to 69 points, you're looking at some amount of positive adjustment. In the industry, we think those that score four points up to 69 points are likely to fall in the one and a half to slightly below 2% bonus opportunity. Remember, if you're scoring less than, equal to or less than 69 points, you will not be eligible for an exceptional performance bonus. It's not a bad thing, it, it's just that's the cutoff. If you score at least 70 points and higher, you're going to gain the most positive payment adjustment and you're going to be eligible for that exceptional performance bonus of at least a half of percent, which is great news. All right. I'll just take a moment to mention uh, that to those of you attending the live session here, we'll definitely be making this recording available to you uh, for all in attendance. So don't worry if some of that information kind of kind of flew by or you didn't get great notes. And those who, have, of course, are watching the recording, feel free and you know click back and take that in again as necessary. Um, Moving forward, Kelly, there are a number of formats available uh, for eligible clinicians to submit their data. Um, do you mind touching on the big ones and their inherent differences for reporting? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, as I mentioned, there's lots of flexibility here at the beginning of this transition into the macro regulation and MIPS specifically. CMS has designed MIPS in 2017 to allow providers to pick their own pace of participation. And so if you haven't heard of that, that's referred to as test. A little bit of data is what you submit, or partial, 90 days of continuous reporting, or full, which is 365 days of reporting. Your logical next question, once you decide how much involvement or participation you want to spend in 2017, is how do I submit my data to CMS in an eligible form. There are all types of ways to do that. Here on the uh, slide, on the right-hand side in the chart, I've provided a look at how each of those submission mechanisms aligns with a number of quality measures that are actually supported. So again, not every submission mechanism allows you to access the full set of quality measures. Think strategically about how you want to submit data and what your broadest opportunity for success, uh, which of those submissions gives you the broadest opportunity for success. So let's take a look at claims first. Now, it's, it's a little bit tongue in cheek when we think about a submission method of claims because your claims are already going to CMS automatically. So if you're going to choose a strategy that's based on claims, you, you don't have to submit additional data. CMS is automatically receiving your claims, adjudicating your claims, and paying your claims, et cetera. But be aware that there are only 74 quality measures that are supported through claims. And there's a second caveat associated with claims. CMS will process your claims for quality determination based on the initial claim. We all know that claims are often um, addended or reworked or something's added or corrected to a claim at a later date. When that occurs, your claim will not be updated for your quality determination, which could, in essence, lead to a poor quality outcome based on claim. That's just the process associated with CMS's quality determination associated with claims. They don't go back and, and match up or look for newer claims. They take the initial claim only to base your quality uh, performance score. The second is through an EHR. 
Um, there are a number of claims, quality measures, sorry, quality measures that are associated with EHRs. I've listed 53 here. The challenge with EHR-based submission is that not every EHR in the industry has a mechanism that allows them to submit data directly to CMS. So you'll want to check with your vendor to make sure that there is a direct connection or the ability to track quality measures through the EHR. Second, and the most robust approach to submitting data and tracking quality is through a qualified registry or a QCDR. Now, if you know the difference between a qualified registry and a QCDR, you'll identify that a qualified registry aggregates a broad variety of quality measures across multiple specialties. QCDRs are also moving in that direction. When they started a few years ago, QCDRs were largely arranged around a specific specialty. So for example, a QCDR for radiology, there's certainly one um, maintained and um, promoted by the American College of Radiology. You might find that for your specialty as well. There's 243 quality measures that are supported by these types of registries. So again, that's your broadest set of quality measures that you can report on. And then finally, there is the CMS web interface. If you're familiar with this, most folks using the CMS web interface use GPRO. GPRO is designed for uh, physician groups that are larger, 25 members and larger. It is a uh, data upload type system. So if you are a group that large, 25 or more providers submitting data and you wish to use the CMS web interface, you must register to use that interface by the last day of June of this year. Otherwise, you cannot use that approach. And they are currently supporting 15 quality measures. Once again, a lot of great information here. Um, but for the moment, uh, can we take a step back? And if you don't mind, I'd like to consider the longer-term benefits of the two reimbursement tracks, MIPS versus APM. And Kelly, is there a clear benefit to either of the two, both in the short and the longer term? Yes, this is one of my favorite questions. And this might be my favorite chart that I'm using in this macro uh, discussion more broadly. If you've um, been with me in a previous um, webinar, you might recognize this, this chart. I'll give you the highlights. We'll certainly uh, make this recording, as Colby said, available to you so that you can study it in depth. But this is published back in 2014 in the Journal of American Medical Association. You can see at the bottom of our slide that one of the authors is Marilyn Tabner, obviously of CMS at the time. What we have here is the framework for transitioning the, the CMS payment system from fee-for-service to population-based payments. And right in the center of our chart, we have category two and category three. That's where MACRA plays. Those two categories is a great visual to sum up the MACRA regulation. In fact, category two is most closely associated with MIPS. That's exactly what we're talking about today. And category three is most closely associated with alternative payment models. So when you think about MIPS and APM, it's, not, it's truly not a one or the other, it's a progression. As we move from fee-for-service to population-based payments, the progression moves us to MIPS-type payments then to alternative payment models, and then to population-based or health-based um, management payments. Now, something that's really interesting is that if you think only of MIPS or APMs under the macro regulation, you get a clear benefit associated with APMs on the basis that under APMs, you continue to earn your fee-for-service payments as well as some, some upside savings, shared savings. Of course, that comes with a downside risk. And there's that 5% per 
per month per beneficiary uh, annual payment. So there's multiple payments associated with APM, while MIPS is a quality-based performance system that allows you to earn some payments that really tap out um, at about three times the, the 4% bonus, so somewhere up around the 10, 11% at the very maximum top of those that are performing super well under MIPS will earn somewhere up around the 10% bonus capability. Many more under MIPS will earn closer to the break even or even in the 4% penalty. So is there a clear benefit? Absolutely. If you're working in MIPS, stay in MIPS, perform well, and then move toward an APM as you develop the skills and framework to do so. If you're currently participating in an APM, stay in the APM, perform well, meet all of the criteria that that APM framework allows you to develop and, and put into place new reporting, new follow-up capabilities, operational efficiencies. Because in 2026, at the very end of the macro regulation, there's a clear benefit to having participated in an APM. Let's talk about what the annual increase looks like for MIPS participants in 2026. We know that in 2026, CMS is telling us that the annual increase for Medicare Part B payments will be one quarter of 1%. So that's your cost of living raise, for example, is what we might call it for employees in America. So CMS looking to give one quarter of 1% to providers that had participated in MIPS. For those that had participated in APN, you're looking at three quarters of 1% increase. That's three times the annual raise starting in 2026. There is a clear benefit to participating in APN. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, this was yet another fantastic webinar. A lot of material covered, and we definitely always appreciate your insights. Um, let us go ahead, though, into the question and answer segment. Um, I have one that really just came to mind as you were presenting, so this is really for me, Kelly. Um, the CMS not updating claims and using the initial submission, is that an attempt to push practices towards uh, just better claim submission practices or towards uh, medical billing services that offer enhanced claim scrubbing? That's a great question, Colby, and I, I certainly wish that I could have insight into the thought process of CMS. I think that that is a desirable outcome to have cleaner claims coming through. Um, it's likely to be more closely aligned with current claims processing techniques and where CMS is sampling the data. So meaning, as the claims come through the system, the very first time they hit the system, there's likely to be some business logic that pulls those claims or flags them for quality analytic purposes. It's very difficult in a system like CMS's claims processing, which you might know, they process more than 600 million claims a day it would be very difficult for them to match um, subsequent claims with the original. It would just take an, an incredible amount of work in the claim system to continually update claims that might have been uh, reworked or resubmitted. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have another question that did come in uh, from, we have a number of them actually. Uh, first, what is recommended for a solo practitioner? Um, I think. Based on our part one of the series, we did go over some of um, what constitutes a MIPS eligible clinician. But if you don't mind, Kelly, just uh, refreshing that really quick for, for our audience. Sure. I'm going to hit the highlights under MIPS eligible clinician. And then um, I'll share a link with Colby and the team that can uh, maybe write a blog on it or post it. Uh, for those that are trying to determine if you're MIPS eligible, the criteria is that you bill Medicare Part B services more than $30,000 a year and you serve more than 100 Medicare beneficiaries. And that is definitely an and. Both of those criteria have to be true. The other um, indicator 
um, if you're eligible is that if you're becoming a Medicare provider for the first time in 2017, you are not eligible to participate. So those are brand new clinicians, those that are serving 100 or fewer patients or billing uh, 30,000 or, I'm sorry, less than 30,000, then you would not be eligible. Now, to verify that, CMS has published a web link, which I'll share with the 360 team for posting. You can go to this web link as a provider, enter your NPI, and get instant feedback on whether you are in or out of the MIPS program. Another question, uh, do registered dietitians need to report in 2017? Um, I don't believe so. Um, in 2017, there are only five types of providers, and so those are your physicians, your physician assistants, and three types of nurses, and you're, you're challenging my memory. We have certified nurses, nurse practitioners, and nurse anesthetists. We don't get an increase in the types of clinicians that have to participate until 2019. So um, registered dietitians and other types of therapies should monitor that start date for 2019. Excellent. This one here is a little, uh, a little bit speculative, if you will, but how practical is it for smaller groups, less than five providers, uh, to shoot for an APM program in 2017? So the APM program takes a pretty wide, um, a wide range of options. And so if you're a small provider group, and I'm, I'm just going to give some hypotheticals here, if you're primary care and you wanted to participate, for example, in the um, CPC program, there's, there's some opportunities to get your feet wet. Now, remember that in 2017, in order to earn all of those benefits associated with being an APM, you need to take part in the advanced APM version of those alternative payment models. And there are only six of them that have been approved for 2017. I believe at this time, uh, this far into the 2017 year, it's too late to join uh, a, as a brand new group. Now, perhaps you can find a CPC team that's already going and join that group. There are some other ways to get around it, but if you're thinking that a small team would start up brand new as um, an advanced alternative payment model program, it's probably too late this year, but definitely look into it for 2018. This is kind of a two-parter, uh, well, sort of. How can I prepare my information now to be ready to fill in this information? Is a spreadsheet appropriate or just use the EHR? And are all systems ready to support this? Now, I can at least briefly answer for the Care360 customers in attendance that our EHR currently does meet the 2017 uh, technology requirements fully certified based on that 2014 edition certification and those associated CMS requirements. Uh, MACRA does require all EHRs to advance to the 2015 certification by January of 2018, and we're absolutely already uh, well on our way, taking steps to be ready for that deadline. Um, of course, most of the, certainly the top tier EHR providers are in the, in the same position of doing everything they can to be ready to support it. But I'll bounce back to the first part of the question for Kelly, um, for uh, those just looking at this now and trying to figure out how to get their information together, uh, spreadsheet, EHR, what's the best way to get this all happening? Yeah, the best way is to step back, take a look at those four categories that you need to track information on. Certainly, uh, portions of those categories are appropriate to align and track with your EHR, like advancing care information, that's the meaningful use piece. The others that you'll need to be strategic about include which of the improvement activities you're going to actually perform and attest to, and then the big one for reporting is quality. Which of those quality measures are you going to track this year? Now, some will find that tracking those in Excel, absolutely a perfect solution, not too complicated. Uh, they have the ability to do some reporting through their EHR, et cetera. Others will look for uh, vendors in the industry to help them either with dashboards or analytic capabilities. Uh, capabilities that the EHR might not be able to provide. In the interest of time, I, I think we'll take one more and then we'll have to move on. Um, this one's actually an easy one. I'm going to 
throw you a softball. Uh, for 2017, is there an option to only report one measure so that in 2019 you will not have a negative uh, adjustment? Yes, absolutely. It's called, <laughs> yeah. it's called the test pace. And uh, again, under MIPS, there are those three paces or levels of participation. And if you perform just one quality measure or four or five improvement activities, you can avoid that penalty in, in 2019, which obviously you earn in 2017. So take action now to avoid that penalty. Once again, thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, Kelly's contact info and resources will be included as part of the follow-up documents that you receive after the presentation, along with the link to the recording. Uh, so you're welcome to reach out to her directly offline if more questions arise. Uh, Kelly, thank you once again for your time and your expertise today. Yes, thank you, everyone. I enjoyed being here. We'll now turn our attention to our sponsor, Care360. Care360 offers a complete end-to-end -end solution for all of your practice needs. We focus on the business side of things so that you can focus on your patients. We connect healthcare organizations, community physicians, and patients to improve access to information and insights. Our applications work harmoniously to promote physician loyalty, provider collaboration, and positive patient outcomes. Because we're backed by Quest Diagnostics, you know that you can rely on a stable and proven partner. Our network is strong, connecting over 450,000 physicians and touching the lives of over a third of all Americans every year. That confidence and reliability that comes standard with every Quest, Diagnostic, Quest Diagnostics Care360 relationship is easy to appreciate and to benefit from. Our holistic suite covers every aspect of your patient and practice life cycle, from appointments and reminders, documenting a patient visit, verifying insurance, processing payments, and right through integrated follow-ups via our MyQuest patient portal. If you're looking for a complete solution from a single source, Care360 has you covered. Our electronic health record is an ONC certified, award-winning product that works extremely well with small practices like yours. It's cloud-based with powerful mobile integration to your smartphone or iPad, allowing you to work wherever and whenever it's convenient for you. The practice management side allows your front office to work more efficiently to manage the flow of patients, keeping your practice organized and agile, linking directly to your EHR so that you can spend more time focusing on your patient and billable encounters instead of the front office administration. And if you're considering an enhanced medical billing service, Care360 has an outstanding revenue cycle management product as well. Few things are as time consuming for your practice as billing and collections, so handing off the more monotonous busy work can free your staff to focus on patients instead of spreadsheets. Trust Care360 to provide you with a solution that's up to date on the evolving trends and changes in the industry. If you have more questions about Care360, please feel free to call or email using the contact information on the screen. And once again, we thank you all for your attendance today. A special thanks to Kelly Whittle and, of course, Care360 for sponsoring the event. Keep an eye on your email in inbox for additional presentations covering related issues in the near future. Thank you so much, and this will conclude today's presentation. Healthier outcomes are now easier to embrace. We know you run a busy practice and efficiency is top of mind. Discover 360 degrees of connection and support. Keep your practice on solid ground with a cloud-based EHR. Care360 offers a full and fully mobile EHR that helps keep medical practices efficient and profitable. While connecting to the larger healthcare community. Join the network of over 300,000 Care360 providers in 90,000 locations and connect to other healthcare providers as well. Coordinate care to and from anywhere. Care360 integrates providers and technologies across sites and care settings. While seeing and sharing the bigger picture. Care360 allows you to send patient information using the CCDA industry standard format, accept information from other providers, and access extensive patient lab histories to help optimize care. Meet meaningful use requirements. Care360 EHR is ONC certified to qualify for meaningful use. While exchanging data simply and securely. Physicians collect and share data with other EHR users to meet industry requirements with Care360 Data Exchange. And with new Care360 Revenue Cycle Management, you can maximize collections and revenue. 
Care360 provides you with a team of billing experts to take complicated billing issues off your plate, allowing you to focus on what matters most, your patients. While reducing your administrative burden. And that means... More time with patients. Care360 also offers many other great advantages. Boost patient engagement and compliance with MyQuest. Patients can view and share vital health information with their healthcare providers. Elevate patient conversations with interactive insights. Enhance lab results with diagnostic insights accessible in Care360 into patients through the MyQuest patient portal. That's 360 degrees of connection and support and healthier outcomes for all. Care360.